Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, October 3rd, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Donald Yakovone, author of Teaching White Supremacy, the textbook battle over race in American history. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro and Lula are headed to a runoff after Lula finished in first, but not by enough. Bolsonaro outperformed polling and Lula did not reach the 50% necessary, so now a second round will be held on October 30th. A new Supreme Court term begins today, and they will hear cases targeting affirmative action, voting, public assistance programs, and more. It looks bleak, but the historic part is still real. Today will be Katanji Brown-Jackson's first official day on the job. The death toll from Hurricane Ian is at least 83 people in Florida, four in North Carolina. Puerto Rico is also still recovering from Hurricane Fiona, right? Fiona? A few weeks back. Hard to keep track because there's so many. At least 25 people died in Puerto Rico. After the Senate passed the continuing resolution to keep the government funded through mid-December, Without the Mansion Rider, but with the $12 billion for Ukraine, the House passed it too and Biden signed it quickly afterwards. So, no government shutdown for now. The mystery around who Perla is, the woman who coaxed migrants from San Antonio onto a plane to Martha's Vineyard for DeSantis' political stunt with Florida taxpayer money, is becoming clearer. She's reportedly, and honestly, the story could not get more ridiculous if we tried, an apt for our purposes, a counterintelligence agent who spent two decades in the army. Whose actual name is Perla? Yeah, she's she's a good she's a good secret agent when she uses her real freaking name. She missed that day of counterintelligence <laughs> school. <laughs> Polls are tightening in the Fetterman and Oz race, frighteningly enough. An average of polling has Fetterman's lead down from nine to four points. Keep, keep the pressure on, please. Also in Pennsylvania, Republican state lawmakers are trying to impeach Larry Krasner because of crime. Not the crime he committed, just crime. This is the Chesa Boudin model. Yep. Anti-government protests in Iran sparked by the police killing of Masa Amini have reached their 16th consecutive day. Videos from Tehran show security forces using tear gas and other violence against student protesters, which has been a theme in these demonstrations where dozens have been killed. Ukraine has submitted an application to join NATO, which is unlikely to happen right now because they're in the middle of a war, but something to note. And lastly, the second military coup in a year has occurred in Burkina Faso, thinking of all of the people experiencing that instability and violence. All this and more on today's program. Yes, my name is Emma. No, it is not Sam Cedar. Doesn't look like Sam Cedar. Uh, it's not me, even though I know the signs can sometimes confuse some people. Uh, maybe you have that thing that Br Brad Pitt says he has where you can't remember human faces, <laughs> which is, I don't know, interesting. But... Um, Sam is uh, called in sick this morning. He's not feeling great. So um, hoping he's okay. We uh, He sa says he tested negative this morning, but he's definitely feeling pretty sick. We spoke to him on the phone, and uh, he sounded it. So 
hope he's okay. There's a lot going around right now. Um, my partner has COVID. I've been, you know, having to mask in all common areas and confined to certain spaces of the apartment. People are either sick with something or sick with COVID. That's basically like half the people in my life right now. Yeah, well, so I feel better because the pandemic is over. So it's yeah. not so bad. That's what Biden said. Yeah. Um, I did hear that on the news one time. But uh, yeah, hoping Sam feels better and uh, and hope he can he can join us at at some point, maybe tomorrow or later in the week. Um, let's talk about Brazil. We're gonna have a guest on to dive a bit deeper into this, which I like to do since. Brazil is not the country that I live in, so my knowledge is not as strong there, but um, I have been following it for a while, much uh, because of this show and, and Michael's emphasis uh, on this, and also just because this could not be a more important election in the, in just for the world and for Brazil, of course. So uh, yesterday, Lula received just under the 50% he need, he would have needed to avoid a runoff. He got 48.4% to Bolsonaro's 43.2% around, and a great majority of the ballots have been counted over 99%, so this is likely to hold. He would have needed, as I said, to exceed 50% to uh, be elected in the first round. So now this runoff for a country of over 200 million people is going to happen on October 30th, and... Um, the, this election could not have higher stakes. Uh, Amazon, the Amazon rainforest could turn into a savanna <laughs> if it continues on this trajectory. It's necessary to absorb carbon as we look down the barrel of the effects of climate change. Um, and under Bolsonaro's uh, leadership, the uh, CO2 emissions doubled in 2019 and 2020 before he was... He was uh, elected, and so it, it, his support for illegal logging in the Amazon has been disastrous, to say the least, let alone his uh, suppression of um, political opposition, his treatment of indigenous uh, people throughout the country. And another reason this would be significant, too, is, one, it would uh, show an opposition to the kind of election denialism that we're seeing in the U.S. Bolsonaro has been flirting with a coup for months at this point, uh, if not years, has said that he will, if he loses, it's probably fraudulent. If he wins, it's not. Does that sound familiar? And uh, you have people like Steve Bannon echoing that as well, because as we discussed with Ruth ben Giat last week, uh, fascism is international in nature. And these... All of these far right wingers are taking clues from one another. Um, but here is uh, Lula before, or right after, actually, I should say, casting his ballot for himself for president. And I will speak over this if you're listening on the podcast uh, because there are subtitles, but uh, he's obviously not speaking in English. So uh, hit play, Bradley, if you could. It's more than an important day for me. I can't go without mentioning to you that four years ago I couldn't vote because I had been the victim of a lie in this country. I was detained at the federal police exactly on election day. I tried to get the ballot box to go to my cell to vote. They didn't. And four years later, I'm here voting with the recognition of my total freedom and with the possibility of becoming president of this country again to try to get the country back to normality. <laughs> and yes, also the important element to this story was Lula was a political prisoner locked up under fraudulent and uh, corrupt circumstances to suppress him because of the threat of his social democratic policies on uh, a lot of powerful people in that country. And yeah, Bolsonaro, I understand he's distasteful, much like Trump is, to business interests in the United States, but they'd much rather have that kind of far right wing fascist than they would have Lula oh, coming yeah. back into po power. I mean, you see even The Economist, like f papers like that play a little bit of footsie with Bolsonaro. So they like the uh, extraction that Bolsonaro is able to facilitate. And the outcome, I think a lot of people were hoping for... Uh, 
a Lula to win in round one, just not have to do a runoff, I think probably would have like honestly saved lives because this could get ugly uh, the way Bolsonaro supporters are. Um, uh, but I guess there's going to have to be a runoff, and that's disappointing. And it also looks like Bolsonaro's party uh, increased their uh, membership in the Congress, which is going to make it tough for uh, uh, um, Lula to govern, uh, assuming he does win the runoff. And uh, But I would also follow uh, at Vincent Bevins, that's Vincent with two N's. Um, he's a good journalist. Uh, says that you know that's also not par for the course for Brazilian politics. So... Um, We'll see, but uh, it's not a not a horrible outcome, but not the exciting um, celebratory outcome that uh, I think a lot of people were hoping for. I mean, he came close, and it would have been nice to have this over with, so we don't have to deal with this great. going into October thirtieth. But um, Lula was saying, you know, hey, I know a lot of people would want me to stop campaigning, but I'm down. Like I'm ready. Let's go. And so that's always been seemingly his attitude towards this. Seems like there should be another debate or a debate between them. Uh, I'm not. I, clear if that was uh just the way it was translated or if that's the case but um so a few more weeks of campaigning this could not be more important as i mentioned for not just brazil but just for the future of the planet given the way that brazil is placed um in terms of preventing catastrophic <laughs> climate events because of the amazon rainforest and the trajectory that it's on right now as well as like just like the political uh um, struggles that are going on uh there's it's a very big difference um when other countries are trying to elect leftists uh and you know work towards socialism to have lula in power in brazil uh compared to bolsonaro yeah and and it would be this a capstone on this incredible movement over the past few years of left-wing governments across Latin America getting elected in response to what was a previous resurgence of far-right governments in Latin America getting elected. Like, we're seeing this now in Colombia and in Bolivia and, you know, uh, in Mexico to a, a degree of, of center-left, lefty president as well. So to have Brazil, the largest country in Latin America, have Lula come back into power... Again, you can't overstate the significance yeah. of that. And I'm getting a correction. It's a uh, technically second round of elections, not a runoff from uh, Cass Moons. Oh, yes. Yes. With that said, uh, we are going to soon uh, head to our guest, uh, Donald uh, Yakovon. But first, we have a message from our sponsors. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Ritual before. But uh, I have, and I try to keep up on my vitamins, but I'm very bad at it, and I forget about it. Um, I know Sam is a huge fan of this sponsor, and it keeps him healthy with uh, the vitamins that he needs. Because <laughs> he's old. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But, uh, uh, but this is really for everybody, because uh, you need to, you know, um, keep yourself healthy. Uh, and I, I need to get better at that, honestly. I'm, I need to use Ritual uh, more. Ritual is a company that was founded by a skeptical mom who didn't trust the multivitamins out there. I know there's a lot of candy gunk out there. Today, Ritual has a uh, first-of-its-kind traceable supply chain so you can see where all of your key ingredients come from and uh, where why they are there. Their flagship multi has USP verification and peer-reviewed and published clinical study. Plus, all of Ritual's products are vegan and non-GMO and third-party tested so you know that you can trust them. Ritual's multivitamins are specifically formulated to help fill nutrient gaps in the diet with key ingredients like vitamin D3 and vegan omega-3 DHA. Their delayed response capsule is designed to be gentle on the stomach. That's good because sometimes when I take my vitamins on an empty stomach, uh, it, can, it can mess me up. But the, the, these delayed release capsules are always helpful. And there's a mint tab in every bottle to keep things fresh. Ritual is a certified B corporation that believes doing good for your health means doing good for the planet. It's delivered straight to your door each month, so you never have to worry about running out. Plus, it's also easy to snooze when you need to. That's really the part that just is, I think, so key here, is having it delivered to your door so you don't, you have no excuse to forget when your bottle runs out. Start a vitamin ritual that you can trust. To get started, visit ritual.com slash majority today and get 10% off your first three orders. That's ritual.com slash majority to start your new ritual today. Ritual.com slash majority.
Now, another word from another one of our sponsors. This is my, this really has changed my entire sleeping experience, Cozy Earth. Remember the last time you had two great nights sleep in a row? Still thinking? Not for me, because I have Cozy Earth. Get ready to sleep like a baby every night with Cozy Earth sheets. Cozy Earth was created to enhance uh, people's lives by offering the softest, most luxurious, and environmentally friendly bedding in the world. With over 5,000 five-star reviews, Cozy Earth has never wavered on that promise. Cozy Earth sheets are made from premium 100% viscous from bamboo, which means they're super soft, lightweight, and temperature regulating, so you sleep more comfortably year-round. The temperature regulating part is key. I have the, the duvet, so I have the comforter, and then there's a duvet cover that comes on top. And I'm, like, even with the air conditioning on, my AC unit's pretty bad, but I sleep really, really hot, and I can't stand it, and it will keep me tossing and turning at night if a blanket is too heavy. But this really solved that problem for me. I I'm being fully honest about that. Cozy Earth bamboo sheets are now available in four natural colors and even come packaged in a stylish, reusable Cozy Earth tote. Uh, whether it's their best-selling luxury sheets, ultra-comfortable loungewear collection, which I've got to check out, or new bath collection, you'll absolutely love shopping at Cozy Earth. Get Cozy now. My audience can save 35% whew, on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority to save 35%, all backed by a 100-night sleep guarantee. That's CozyEarth.com slash majority. Cozy Earth dot com slash majority and lastly oh boy isn't it crazy that in 2022 we have high-speed internet celebrities going to space and electric cars and yet people are st still cleaning their bums the way our victorian brothers and sisters did with toilet paper step into the 21st century and upgrade your bathroom routine and start washing your bum with hello tushy bidets <laughs> Because smearing your business around with toilet paper is so 100 years ago. The Hello Tushy Bidet attachment washes your bum with fresh water for a way better clean than toilet paper. Simply spray and pat dry. It attaches to your existing toilet. No electrician or plumber needed. It installs in less than 8 minutes. Cuts down on your TP use by 80%, saving money and paper waste. So, hey, be environmentally friendly and uh, also modern with a Hello Tushy Bidet. Hello Tushy has cleaned over 1 million happy bums. I want all of our listeners to have clean bums. That is, I wake up in the morning, I say that as my affirmation in the mirror. Does the Majority Report audience have a clean butt? That's my priority. They relax a little bit on it, but you know, it's strident. No, I'm, uh, I'm committed. Visit hellotushy.com slash majority to get 10% off plus free shipping right now. That's hellotushy.com slash majority for 10% off and tag at hellotushy on social media so they can celebrate your clean bum with you. You're taking a butt shot on Instagram for your followers, looking good? Tag hellotushy so everybody and all of your dating prospects know that your butt is as clean as a whistle. Um... <laughs> That wasn't even in the cup. <laughs> HelloTushy.com slash majority for 10% off. All right, we're going to take a quick quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by da Donald Yakovon, uh, author of Teaching White Supremacy, the textbook battle over race in American history. <laughs>
We are back and we are joined now uh, by Donald Yakovone, historian and associate at the Hutchins Center for African and American uh, African and African American Research at Harvard University, whose book is entitled Teaching White Supremacy, the Textbook Battle Over Race in American History. Uh, Donald, thanks so much for, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, a absolutely. A actually, the uh, title of the book was changed. You, you have an older version of the title. Oh, I'm and, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. I, I've been at this for a very long time. And uh, that was an, an original title. Uh, it's, it's now America's Democratic Ordeal and the Forging of Our National Identity. That's the subtitle. The main title remains. Okay, I uh, I to I completely apologize, uh, but yes, we will update that and make sure that that's completely accurate in our show notes when we link when we link to your okay. book. So, um, sure. so so let's start off with uh, with really the premise of your book. Um, you, you start you with uh, quoting James Baldwin, one of you know my all time mm -hmm. favorite Americans, yeah. who who says, "I was taught in American history books." that Africa had no history and that neither had I. And that's just obviously just so profoundly true. And and not much has changed since then. In fact, we're in the midst of a large political anti-critical race theory movement from the right, right uh, as, a, as an, in an effort to cement erasure of black history. Um, just just talk about uh, the genesis of the idea and how one, it, it's, it's, it's so it's both present and all throughout our history. Yeah, uh, it, it it certainly is, and I, and um, the uh, the problem, of course, remains and remains uh, embedded in the nature of American culture. Uh, there has been change. We don't want to deny the fact that there has been change. There's been significant change. Uh, anyone who is my age can compare what, for instance, is on television compared to. Uh, in the 1950s and, and 60s compared to what it is today. It's a different world. Um, back in the 1950s and 60s, no one would have ever suggested that an African-American could be president of the United States. That was just unheard of. And if you advocated it, you your, your sanity would have been questioned. Um, however, the election of an African-American uh, president has unleashed a torrent of uh, anxiety among those uh, among that portion of American society, which retains this emphasis upon whiteness, which was born on uh, in ideas of whiteness, and uh, as not only one's personal identity but as a national identity. And um, uh, Jill Lepore, who teaches uh, at Harvard and also writes for the New Yorker, uh, wrote a book. Uh, at the time of uh, Obama's election, stating that his election to many Americans seemed to have torn a hole in the fabric of time. This is as profound as it gets. And I think um, the, the, uh, the issues we are now facing, uh, the crisis we have been facing now for uh, several years, uh, is indicative both of the progress we have made and the terrible anxiety that so many Americans feel. It is as if a tectonic plate underneath the surface of the earth is cracking and being washed away because so many Americans for so long have identified themselves and the nature and the nation with whiteness. Their very identities are formulated upon what is in fact a fiction. There are no such things as races. These are uh, products of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, to, uh, a hierarchy established based on no nothing we would call science today, but based on observations uh, and the purpose of which was to place people of European descent at the top of a hierarchy and people of African descent at the bottom. And, and what your book does such an amazing job with is ta show how this wasn't just uh, an ideology that w was embedded in our learning methods and in our textbooks, which you do study, um, sure. as written by Southerners, but that the, the definition <laughs> right. of Americanism as whiteness, American equals white, 
is uh, is as foundational to the the way that our population was educated as anything and as um it, it was essentially a project of like the people who were actually writing these books northern publishers yeah. and yes. uh and elites in in some of the institutions like harvard were uh were, oh, absolutely were, you're a part of yeah sure oh absolutely in fact this is a major theme uh, of, of the book uh we modern Americans are accustomed to thinking of uh, racial prejudice as uh, a product of the history of the uh, history of slavery in the South and of Southern resistance to integration. Well, in, and of course that's all true and one would not want to deny the horrific legacy of slavery and uh, uh, Jim Crow segregation in the South. It's true. It's very true. It's painfully true. However, the ideology of white supremacy is a northern creation, uh, and uh, the, it begins right at the beginning of the colonization uh, of the colonies and continues right through to the present day. Uh, we have a, uh, we had a society in which all the major aspects of our culture, whether we're talking about education, of course religion, politics, and certainly the law were all dominated by uh, Northern trained, usually Northern born, but certainly Northern trained uh, scholars, ministers, uh, and, and the like. Uh, and it be, as I said, it begins right at the start. And uh, one of the most um, uh, symbolic, I think that's the right word, uh, examples of this is Samuel Sewell, who's remembered today as being the judge of the Salem witchcraft trials. However, he was also uh, the person who wrote the first anti-slavery pamphlet in American history. In 1700, he published The Selling of Joseph. Now, it's, it was indicative that uh, few people read it. Um, and it was, and that is because, as he confessed in his, in his pamphlet, that most of the colonists could not tolerate the idea of an African-American who was not a slave and was free and, uh, there, and therefore approaching equality. It was in, an impossibility. And he described this impossibility as uh, being a kind of what he called, quote, extravasant blood. That is blood that exists outside the regular veins and capillaries of the body. It is alien. It is an alien force. It is forever uh, outside of white experience. In fact, this was so embedded in his own mind, even though he was an opponent of slavery, uh, condemned slavery as unchristian, uh, condemned the slave trade as horrific. Yet, in his diary, he wondered that upon his death, would he retain his whiteness, quote, after the resurrection? <laughs> wow. I mean that's how that's how deep and abiding this issue is in American culture. And you I mean, how do you how do you connect that with sort of the combination of both historically and today, um, American identity with um, this sort of evangelism and religiosity of, of being, you know, Christian, but also in the way that people deify the founding fathers, for example, I would yep, argue sure. that that is a extension of white supremacy, supremacy uh, thought and, and how deeply mm -hmm. embedded that is. Like, how does religion intertwine with the kind of patriotic, patriotic view of, of America that is also inextricably a white view? Well, uh, it, it, it all um, is based on who you include as being sort of God's constituency, if you will. Um, if, you cons if you do not consider uh, people of non-European descent to be not fully human, then you can talk about the Garden of Eden, you can talk about all aspects of Christianity, um, and not for a second extend those thoughts that that belief those beliefs to people outside of uh 
what we call white society and culture. Uh, in fact, um, you know, the, the, the legacy is divided on this issue because you have uh, many Christians and uh, ministers in the 19th century who were willing to accept um, people of African descent as human, but a lesser form of human. But then you have other people within Christianity who considered people of African descent to be a completely different species of human designed by nature and God to do the white man's work. And this, of course, is the foundation of the ideology uh, of um, John H. Van Every, who's the who I spend the, uh, the second yes. chapter uh, discussing, who, who, again, is so representative of, of American culture and the depth of belief in white supremacy, uh, even if people don't necessarily accept individual aspects of his of his thought um but he is reflective of the depth of, of uh, uh, and centrality of white supremacy in fact um it, it is to his mind uh and this is something that that tony morrison even uh, wrote about that the um, presence of africans in American culture was a necessity for democracy to grow and that we could not have white democracy without the African presence because of the uh, presumed difference between the two that it proved to uh, American colonists and then uh, American citizens that the differences among people of European descent, when of course Europe had a long history of it had, in fact, there are more years of war in, within the European history, and there are of peace. Uh, so, uh, and at the time, um, democracy was not considered to be uh, a legitimate and doable form of government. That's why you had all, uh, uh, you know, royalty in, in 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 Europe. But in the United States, I mean, yes, it, it, once the colonists become the United States, um, democracy becomes possible because the the what we would call the mudsill class is under control mm. and um to, just to drive home this point uh in 1954 the harvard uh psychologist uh, gordon alport uh, wrote a uh, still stunning book on the history of prejudice uh in in the united states and uh, buried in in, in this deep, but <laughs> like pretty thick study on American prejudice, buried deep in that uh, is a story because he did, he did a lot of interviews uh, to come up with this, with the theories, uh, psychological theories of why prejudice was so uh, central to American culture. He interviewed a five-year-old white girl and she expressed her sadness that a local black family who lived very close to where she lived was mo was moving away, and uh, Alport I think was kind of rather stunned to, uh, to hear that this five year old girl was upset that an African American family was moving. Well, why? Well, now she said there is no one that we're better than. Mm. That's a direct quote. Wow. So even um, even in a five year old girl, the, the the profound depth of white supremacy is already embedded. I mean, she's not even in kindergarten yet. She's not even in the the uh, education system yet. The uh, dominance of, of of whiteness has already been imprinted on her. I mean, your your talk about uh, the how democracy. Um, it, it the I'm reminded of we, we were, we've been talking about Israel Palestine. This is a bit of, uh, on uh, of an aside on the show before. And John Kerry was criticized a few years ago for saying that um, it you can't have a Jewish state and also for Israel to be democratic because that's by me by its very nature excluding uh, Palestinians from that voting process. And right. it's quite a similar tension here that you that you talk about. Um, because to 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 make that point to undercut 
uh, the United States as a democratic be, uh, city on a hill <laughs> or as right. something that is aspirational as opposed yes. to uh, fundamentally a uh, found, founded on, on a white supremacist ideology that is exclusionary and therefore undemocratic, that mm -hmm. that does break the kind of religious orthodoxy that um, of of American patriotism, which is also, of course, yeah. connected to white supremacy. Yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, it, you know, at the same time, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, there has been change. Yeah, there has been greater, far greater acceptance than has ever occurred in American culture. And you know, if we could ex uh, sort of place ourselves uh, maybe 40 or 50 years in the future, we might see a long, gradual process uh, in which um, this country begins, uh, we can trace the, the, uh, the decline of emphasis on white supremacy and the acceptance of uh, a multiracial or a multicultural country. Uh, that's an optimistic view. Um, we do seem to be moving in that direction, it, it, but history doesn't move in straight lines and yeah. it zigs and zigs and zags. And right now we're going through a real zigzag pro uh, process, which, which at times is well, clearly extremely upsetting and disturbing, uh, especially when we have uh, schools from all over the country that are still inculcating uh, white supremacy in their students. There, I, I ran across, and I mentioned this in the in the last chapter of the book, uh, I more than mentioned, discuss it pretty pretty uh, pretty thoroughly, where you have uh, classrooms in which there are slave auctions. No, this is Vermont, New Jersey, New York, the state of Washington, Florida. It's all over. Uh, can you imagine? what it would be like for um, a, a, a young African-American student, sixth grade, seventh grade, even fifth grade, uh, to be forced to be compelled to stand in front of their white classmates to be auctioned off to the highest bidder and then told that if they were to run away, they would be beaten. Now, in fact, uh, there were investigations into some of these and as you would well imagine, this has created damaging, uh, quite a bit of damage on, on the um, victims of these, these activities. And when parents objected, they were told that this is part of the established curriculum. We have no choice. We have to do this. It's just astonishing. This isn't, it, the, this isn't history. This is, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a, a sick version of Hollywood that's going on in classrooms. And, and so, I mean, your, your, your scholarship on this, I mean, you studied uh, hundred thousands of textbooks from the 19th and 20th century um, to, to, to inform your book here. And yes. um, I, you mentioned that second chapter on John H. Van, uh, Van Eve, Van Every. Ave, Every. Van Every. Yeah, yeah. I, he was he was a publisher in New York, and um, you make a really compelling case about his uh, his ideas being so significant in the way that white supremacy is conceived here in this country. Can you yeah. expand on 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 him as a figure in in your story? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, again, going back to this theme of northern responsibility for creating uh, the ideology of white supremacy. Well, he was Canadian born. You don't get any more northern than that. <laughs> In, in North America. Uh, and uh, he, he became a physician and then uh, for most of his life abandoned uh, his, his career as a physician to become the nation's first professional racist. He created a uh, publishing empire in the heart of Manhattan, published several books on, uh, on one of them bearing the title of white supremacy, um, numerous pamphlets, which were uh, excerpts, essentially excerpts from his many books, uh, and two newspapers, one of which was shut down during the Civil War by the Lincoln administration because it verged on treason. 
Um, and then he changed the name of it uh, to the Cauc to the <laughs> to the Caucasian. <laughs> this is this is a, a fascinating gentleman uh, who was a marketing genius, and, and for the 19th century, it is truly it's truly astonishing uh, how he uh, used marketing uh, principles uh, to promote white supremacy. Uh, for instance. Uh, he uh, offered, uh, and he published these these offers in in, uh, in newspapers around the country, uh, even in the South, uh, and especially after the Civil War, he offered that to to anyone who could uh, put together uh, a number of subscriptions from his neighbors, totaling about ninety dollars, and send that in, uh, that person would be rewarded with the nation's leading sewing machine. <laughs> now, if you think about this, it sounds like a, a prize. Bit no, it is a prize <laughs> for doing all this work in gaining subscriptions. But when you think about why a sewing machine, because it brings the family mm. into this orbit. In one year alone, he ran 1,500 different advertisements in 1,500 different American newspapers. It, uh, and I, I did a lot of research trying, you know, trying to see what he was up to. And it was rare that I could find a newspaper that didn't have an advertisement for one of his books. And like Walt Whitman, he would even review his own books in, in the press to... Um, spread the word about his, his, his principles and, I, and ideas. Uh, and so he creates this empire in the heart of Manhattan. Uh, he, he continues uh, through the Civil War. He continues, it grows even larger after the Civil War where he, he takes on um, radical reconstruction to convince the nation that uh, uh, this way it may seem contradictory at first, that we need African Americans. They are essential. They are essential because they are a lower species of humanity designed by nature and God to do the white man's work. He denied the reality of slavery. He said slaves don't exist. He refused to use the term. This is after uh, 1855. He refused to use the term because to him, slaves, or, or, uh, slavery was an institution that occurred in white Europe. Hmm. Uh, and that applied to humans enslaving, capturing other humans of, of the same ilk. But since People of African descent were a, was a low, were a lower form of humanity, uh, like like he said, uh, the the eagle being a species of bird, an owl being a species of bird, but different. One he thought superior to the other. Eagle being obviously the superior in his mind, superior bird, and the owl being the inferior bird. But they're both birds. In the same way, he explained, you have the superior. Uh, uh, person of European descent, and then you have the inferior human designed by nature and God to do the white man's work. Now, the North uh, uh, was uh, largely dedicated, uh, this is up to and a few years after the Civil War, uh, to the American Colonization Society. Now, I think uh, their their desire was, yes, we don't want slaves, but we also don't want people of African descent living with us. Mm. If all people of African descent had lived in the South, there wouldn't have been an American colonization society in the North uh, because there would have been no need as far as they were concerned. Uh, so uh, Van Every is is a, a little bit different than the average uh, um when it comes to uh, assessing uh, the reality of, of, of black life in, in, in uh, American culture. But in his mind, 
um, they were to do the white man's labor and they would do that labor mostly in the South. Well, he was diabolical seemingly and ahead of his time to a degree yes. because I yeah. am, again, I, I like to bring these the, just to show how history is still present. The, the entirety of uh, this anti-CRT push and the yeah. uh, school board uh, meetings and how that, um, you know, getting, getting parents activated on that front is also about bringing white supremacy into the family and making it a politically yes. activating uh principle and so you can see how that how that continues um i i do want to uh talk a bit about you mentioned reconstruction there yep, how sure. that how that changed things and how you were able to trace the way that race and slavery was pro discussed pre-civil war post and then also this kind of more like um uh the more positive framing of slavery in some of these textbooks uh -huh. at at the yes. at the turn of the of the century going into right. the 20s and 30s yeah yeah well uh, i i want to make it clear that this is a this is not a book about a bunch of bad books <laughs> uh, this, this, this is this is an assessment of american culture and american identity and the great thing about which i discovered you know entirely by chance uh was that these that the textbooks of course embody American values, American principles. They not only trace the history uh, of, of the nation, but what the culture is supposed to value and honor. It's, uh, it's glorious principles and uh, the future it seeks to create. Uh, it, it, we could call them like prayer books in, in a way. Um, and the fact that that so many, the overwhelming majority of them, um, placed the priority on whiteness. And I, you, you can't, I can't come up with a better example of this than one 1930 textbook, which on the very first page, right below chapter one, in capital letters, the history of the white man. Now, <laughs> it, it can't be any more explicit than that. And But it's not just a matter of uh, what is said about African-Americans African -Americans in these textbooks. It's also what isn't said, how they are not included in the narrative of America. They are always exceptional, just like Samuel Sewell, extravasant blood outside the regular veins and capillaries of the body politic. And that's the way uh, African-Americans were presented throughout uh, uh, American history in the textbooks. So textbooks are, are evidence. I don't discuss them because they're, 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 they're textbooks. They, I treat them the same way I would treat uh, a manuscript collection or newspapers or magazines. They offer the evidence, the statements, uh, and the lack of material um, for uh, what is happening in the culture. And it, it's a convenient narrative that goes, uh, and, and the collection I, I used um, was uh, housed and is housed uh, in the uh, School of Education's library at Harvard. And there were 3,000 of these. Uh, and I cited uh, 220 in this, in this, uh, in this book. Uh, so I got a really good representative sampling of how Americans have con conceived of themselves and the African-American role in American culture. And it is a horrific story, which becomes even worse once African-Americans become free. There's a brief interlude after the Civil War in which the principles of radical reconstruction do get infused into the culture and many textbooks uh, are, are um, printed and, and are published, again, by Northern presses. They, they have the monopoly on all these things. Uh, to inculcate principles of, of radical reconstruction for racial equality and and true democracy. I was really quite 
uh, astonished to see the depth of, of commitment to uh, true democracy in many of these textbooks, in particular by um, the ones published, the one published by Charles Carlton Coffin, who was the North's uh, most famous uh, Civil War reporter. And he, he dedicated his career after um, the Civil War to writing the history of the United States, uh, actually the history of liberty from its earliest days right through his own, his own times. And these books were immensely popular uh, during the, the latter part of the 19th century. In fact, uh, the Boston Public Library had 45 copies <laughs> of his book. All of them were perpetually out on loan. So he was popular. His, uh, they included images of abolitionists. This was all, almost unheard of. Uh, in fact, uh, the textbooks up until the Civil War didn't even discuss the abolitionist movement. But here they become heroic because they are committed to liberty and justice. Uh, and that, pers that, that persists from the 1870s at the 1880s, 1890s, at the same time that lost cause ideology is growing. Uh, so there is a kind of battle, thus the original title uh, I, <laughs> uh, you had cited at the beginning of this. Well, because uh, it, was, it was clear that there, there was um, uh, a, uh, there was strife over the future of the United States, and you could see it manifested in, in these textbooks. Um, but by uh, the early 20th century, uh, after African Americans had enjoyed uh, decades of freedom and were progressing, there's no question about it, uh, African American culture was progressing. African Americans were succeeding. And that, turns out, was a threat to white supremacy. In fact, uh, and I cite this in, in the first chapter, the more African Americans from the colonial period right through the 20th century, the more African Americans became uh, like the people around them, emerging from slavery, you know, becoming uh, uh, citizens of a sort, uh, becoming economically successful, going to college, W.E.D. Uh, du Bois. My God, these these people were brilliant. Uh, the more that happened, the more people of white uh, or European descent reacted in horror and fear. Thus, the prejudice increases because African Americans are becoming more successful. And to keep them in their place, you needed more suppression. And thus, the textbooks became even more outrageous in their denunciation of black culture. Uh, and textbook after textbook, and we're talking about the 1940s and 1950s, and right into the 1960s, uh, denying um, that African Americans could even learn. They, they, uh, John D. Hicks, who was a extremely popular and successful historian at University of California, Berkeley, belittled what he called the African-American quest for education. What? They want to be educated, and that is a pathetic quest in your mind? And this is in his own textbooks he's writing. This is in personal correspondence. This is what he is teaching. And so that is what, I mean, to to kind of bring this all home, That what yeah. that's what makes it so, I mean, well, actually, I have another question, I guess, about uh, really briefly too about the lost sure. cause myth being embedded in some of these textbooks as well. Do you mind? Do you mind touching on that? Oh well, no. Uh, and f again, uh, we are accustomed to thinking about lost cause ideology as what it was, of course, a, a Southern reaction to um, the Civil War and the and the defeat in the Civil War. And we have a situation where, yes, they lost the military uh, aspect of the war, but won the peace. And it was expressed through this lost cause ideology, the glory of the South uh, and uh, the heroism of Robert E. Lee, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all because of mistaken notion in the North about the, the poor African-American, when in fact, 
uh, slave master treated their slaves so well, pampered them. Uh, and one of, one of the books I read even said that George Washington was the typical uh, slave owner who uh, gave his slaves broth, sweetened tea, and even, quote, a little wine. Mm -hmm. That is the, the image of slavery that, was, that became perpetuated to defend the South and its principles of black suppression. Um, well, the first expressions of this lost cause ideology was in the North, not the mm -hmm. South. Uh, John H. Van Every, who um, is, you know, as I had said before, uh, the first professional racist, uh, wrote a textbook along with his, uh, his business uh, partner, Rushmore G. Horton, whose name is actually on it, um, to propagate these ideas that slaves were forced from their plantations by Union troops because they did not want to be quote free. They loved being on the plantation, serving their white masters, and uh, it took uh, Union soldiers at bayonet point to force them off their plantations into quote freedom unquote. Um, and Abraham Lincoln was a dupe of the British royalty who was behind the Civil War to uh, f emancipate slaves and destroy American democracy. That's what was behind the conflict. Um, his textbook was read and swallowed whole by Edward Pollard, who wrote the book, The Lost Cause, who was famous because of that. He read Van Every, and he had been a defender of slavery, but after reading Van Every, he realized, he said, that these people weren't slaves. We don't defend slavery. We're, we are simply, um, quote, defending an inferior people, giving them Christianity, giving them uh, 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 trades and tools, and, quote, education, unquote, unquote. The way uh, the, the African presence in the South from the beginning was a Christian mission to save or, or rescue people of African descent from a, a, the, a, an abysmal swamp of ignorance, what they referred to it. So this is turning, turning uh, history inside out, but it isn't simply a Southern manifestation. It is a national manifestation. And the ideology is Northern. Uh, white supremacy grows up along with slavery. Slavery was a uh, North American phenomenon, not a strictly Southern one. And the first uh, laws to, to preserve and legalize slavery was formed in Massachusetts in 1641. Mm. And and not to cut you, you off, but yeah. the other thing you know you write about is Harvard uh, was at, studying eugenics, uh, promoting those kinds of theories. Uh, the the Dunning School, um, I believe, came out of one of the Ivies. Uh, uh, Columbia. Columbia, yeah. I mean, yeah. the the this the, like the the intellectual origins, yes. <laughs> intellectual right. origins yes. of of the, this. Uh, are are paved into like the most esteemed institutions in the north. Absolutely, and the publishing industry was a north for, for the most part was a northern phenomenon, and, and the overwhelming number of textbooks uh, from uh, the, the beginning in 1800 right through the 1980s and really to the present were published not in San Antonio, not in Charleston but Boston, New York, Chicago. Absolutely. It's a northern uh, bound uh, phenomenon created, dominated, uh, not southern. So, uh, you know, after doing all the research for this and writing the book, uh, it came clear to me that um, 
if we are ever to solve the problems that we, we are facing and facing in increasing levels today, uh, we must uh, recognize national responsibility, not sectional responsibility for this issue. Well, uh, that's a wonderful note to, to leave us off on here. Donald uh, Yakovon, historian and associate at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. And the book is Teaching White Supremacy, America's Democratic Ordeal and the Forging of Our National Identity. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Donald. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, no, thank you. Um, all right. With that said, we are going to wrap up the free hour of this program um we'll be heading into the fun half we'll be doing some clips taking your calls reading your ims but first matt what is happening on left reckoning oh yeah we did a we released a bunch of content over the weekend actually uh, for everybody uh asal rod uh research director at the uh um national iranian american council or i think I think that's what NIAC stands for. I'm talking about these protests um, in Iran and how to uh, not react to them stupidly uh, and callously. <laughs> um, and uh, um, and also we did a, uh, for Patreons, patreon.com slash so left reckoning, uh, a conversation on the anatomy of the micro sect and how uh, we go from splintering into sex into actually forming a movement on the left. That's an essay by Hal Draper from 1973. So patreon.com says left reckoning to hear David and I talk about that. And uh, on ESVN today, we will be live at 4 p.m. We will be recapping the uh, NFL weekend, including the Giants are three and one and the Jets are two and two. I mean, this is a really a great time for Bradley and I to uh, be doing the show because this is not this is the best start both of our teams have been on since for for the Giants, it's literally at least a decade. The Jets, what more? Yes, more. Your mic's on down. Yes, yes more. more. Okay. Um. So uh, we'll be diving into that, but we also will have our first guest on the show. I'm very excited to have my friend Greg Kaplan of Blue Shirts Breakaway on to preview the NHL season. But he's also, despite having a uh, the top Rangers podcast uh, and one of the top hockey podcasts in the country uh he is a probably a bigger mets fan than he is a rangers fan so he's going to talk about the major league baseball playoffs preview it and uh i don't want to speak for greg but i would imagine he's going to have some sort of meltdown about how the the mets just completely shit the bed over the weekend yeah tune in for me to scream about that for and a bradley bit before too. i go to the game tonight yeah that's smart to uh, make your like main sort of um, focus professionally your second favorite sports team because I feel like making it your favorite would lead to like you know, be mentally unwell. I I mean he's such a dogmatic Mets fan that I think that that is like probably some of his thinking. So um, check that out. Uh, he he'll he'll have some good rants for you guys here on the Majority Report channel, but then also just download us on uh, podcasts and uh, the podcast platforms like Apple and Spotify. Rate us five stars and subscribe to youtube.com slash ESVN show for clips and eventually our content's gonna be migrating over there. So check us out. All right, uh, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's gonna be the same as it looks like in six months from now. And I don't know if it's necessarily gonna be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm 